All right. Good morning. Happy day. Thank you so much for joining. Today we are going to talk about Social Security Disability for Cancer Patients. Um, if you or someone you love has been diagnosed with cancer and they're no longer able to return to work in any capacity, this webinar is for you. Um, a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna cover some Social Security Disability basics, just so you have a general understanding of the programs. Then we will move into guidance from the agency, potential listings, considerations. And then of course, I always end my webinars with how how an attorney can help you with your social security disability claim, because I find a lot of people don't really know what we can do. A little bit about me. My name is Caitlin Wildoner. I'm the founding attorney of Beacon Disability, which is a law firm based in Florida. And we strictly focus on practicing federal administrative disability law and handling social security disability cases at the agency level matters for social security disability insurance, which is SSDI and supplemental security income, SSI benefits. Um, Agency level is everything from the initial application through the appeals council. So that's where we focus. We do not handle any federal matters. As promised, a little bit about social security disability basics. There are the two programs, as I alluded to just a minute ago. There's social security disability insurance, which is SSDI benefits. And then there's supplemental security income, which are SSI benefits. And a lot of times people get them confused, they conflate them, and it's easy to do. Um, the main difference in the two is that SSDI benefits are based on what you paid into the system while you were able to work. So SSDI benefits and retirement benefits, I like to say they come out of that same pot, okay, based on what you were able to pay into the system. SSI benefits, on the other hand, are not. It's a federal, more of a welfare benefit. There are income and asset restrictions tied to SSI benefits. The two programs both require a finding of disability, which means that you are totally disabled and unable to work for a period of at least 12 months due to physical and or mental impairments. So Social Security Disability, um, SSDI and SSI, they are not meant to be a temporary situation. Now, that's not to say they're permanent. And if you're 25 and on benefits right now, that you'll be on benefits until you retire because they do pull cases for review every so often, but it doesn't cover if you're out for three months to get treatment and then you're able to get back into work, it doesn't cover that type of situation. Even if your treatment timeline is six months or nine months, you've got to be disabled and unable to work for a period of at least a year. Now, that year does not have to pass before you apply. So if you go to the doctor and the doctor's telling you, okay, here's what your treatment plan is. You know, we think we'll be able to, to kind of help you in three months time. You'll be back to normal. Well, that's great. And that's, that's where you want to operate from. That's where you want to think about. That's the goal. If after those three months, you're realizing, okay, that didn't happen. And in fact, I've now got these other ancillary issues that are still preventing me from working. That's where you may want to think about applying. Now, if those ancillary issues are going to resolve themselves in a month or two, you know, let's say you sprained your ankle, um, that's okay. But if, if you're looking now three months in and you're thinking, I might be here for a while in this position of not being able to work, that's where you can apply. So you don't have to be out of work for a whole year before applying. It's just that the disability has to either already had lasted, so you had to have been out of work for a year, or be expected to last at least one year. So that's that's the the twelve months. Is the twelve months does not have to pass before you apply, and in fact, if it's SSI only that you're eligible for, if you don't have enough work credits for SSDI then you wanna apply as soon as possible. You don't wanna wait that year. You wanna apply as soon as possible, as soon as you realize that it's expected to last at least 12 months, okay? All right, so the process, once you apply, it goes through a five-step evaluation process. The first step in that five steps is, are you engaging in substantial gainful activity? So that's work. Are you working? If you're not working, are you volunteering in a substantial amount? So basically what they're looking at at that threshold is if you're working 20 hours a week or more, or this year, if in 2022, if you're earning more than $1,350 a month in gross earnings, the evaluation stops there. You cannot be found disabled under the rules of Social Security 
Social Security will not even get to the medical part because you're engaging in substantial gainful activity and therefore by their definition, you cannot be found disabled. The second step, if you are not engaging in substantial gainful activity, it moves to step two, which is, okay, do you have at least one severe medically determinable impairment? If you don't have any severe medically determinable impairments, then the evaluation stops there. Social Security denies the claim. If you have at least one severe medically determinable impairment, then it moves to step three and says, okay, does that meet or equal one of our blue book listings? If you do, evaluation stops there and you're approved. If you don't meet or equal a listing, it still goes. It, the case continues. And it kind of looks at kind of a step 3B, which is where Social Security will review the medical records, review some of what you've submitted as far as your activities of daily living and things like that. And they'll create a residual functional capacity or an RFC for you based on what they see in the file. OK, so they will say, you know, you're limited to sedentary work, light work, medium work, whatever the physical level is, you know, how much weight you can lift. They'll also look at how many hours in a day you can sit, stand and walk. They'll look at your ability to do postural changes such as climbing stairs, climbing ladders, ropes and scaffolds, climbing. Um, I said both of those climbing stairs and ramps ladders, ropes, and scaffolds, um, bending, kneeling, stooping, crouching, crawling, all of that, like you look at all that. They will also look at any mental impairments that you've got, any limitations in your ability to remember, any limitations in your ability to interact with others, that kind of thing. They create that RFC. Then using the RFC they created from your file, they look, step four, can you go back to your past work? Could an individual who has your work history and your RFC that they've assigned go back and do that past work? If you can, the case evaluation stops there, you'll get that denial. They'll say you can go back to your past work. If you can't go back to your past work, it goes to step five and Social Security looks at, okay, you can't go back to your past work, but with your skills that you might have gained, if you have skilled or semi-skilled past work, did you gain any skills that are transferable to other jobs that you can do with your RFC? Okay, so that's kind of how it is. If, if you cannot engage in any other work, that's when you get an approval. So if it, you can either meet a listing or get to step five and not be able to engage in other work, those will get an approval. Everything else will result in a denial. So when evaluating a case that involves a cancer diagnosis, there's a lot that Social Security is looking at. Um, number one, just like with any condition, it impacts people differently. Um, there's, you know, a lot under the surface that has an ultimate impact on how you respond to treatment. So when evaluating that case, Social Security is specifically looking for the origin of the cancer. They're looking at the extent of the involvement. Has it metastasized? Has it, you know, Ch changed at all. They're looking at the duration, the frequency, and the response that you have had to any anti-cancer therapy. And then they're looking at, as I kind of mentioned earlier and alluded to, they're going to look at the effects of any post-therapeutic residuals. Social Security will apply the listings to the cancer that originates from that specific site. So breast cancer is always evaluated under the breast cancer listing, even if it's metastasized to other parts. And as always, and as I just talked about with that five steps, Social Security, if you don't meet a listing, they evaluate your residual functional capacity to see if you can engage in substantial gainful activity. So that's very important to note is with Social Security, oftentimes you'll see having that diagnosis is not enough. Um, you know, it's, it's a gut punch when you get that diagnosis and a lot of things are, are running through the mind, trying to figure out everything. Um, with Social Security, just having that diagnosis alone, and this, this is not cancer specific, this is across the board, just having a diagnosis alone does not often build up enough for an approval. So that's why they're looking at all of that other stuff in the file to see what else is going on? And is there a possibility for disability approval there? When it comes to medical records specifically, uh, medical records are the backbone of social security disability cases. They help the agency understand what's going on. 
more so than your statements of, I only get out of bed, you know, to use the restroom on days after the chemotherapy. Um, and so they're, they're more looking for medical evidence that specifies what's going on. And when that primary site can't be identified for whatever reason, Social Security will use evidence that documents where it's metastasized to, to evaluate the impairment in that case. Social Security is also going to look for any operative reports, including if there's any relevant pathology reports. And they're also specifically looking for evidence that involves any recurrences, persistence, or progression of the cancer, what the response to therapy has been, and whether there's any significant residuals. Okay. So here is a list of all of the listings included under section 13 of the blue book. These are all related to cancers. Um, so I'll leave this up for a minute. And if you or someone that you love has been diagnosed with cancer, you can take a look at this listing, list of listings and see, okay, this is where they are. I will go through a few specifics in the coming slides, um, but it can be helpful to just look up Social Security listing 1307 for multiple myeloma, and you can see specifically what Social Security is looking for. Okay. So I'll leave that up for just a second to take a look at. As you can see, I mean, there's they they do cover a broad gamut of, of potential cancers. Each one, as you'll see in a minute, differs a little bit on what they're looking for. And again, it's not just a matter of having that diagnosis. It's a matter of having that diagnosis and what that means for you specifically. All right. So first looking at skin cancer. Um, being in Florida, unfortunately, it's a very, very common occurrence. And so with respect to that, Social Security is going to be looking for either a sarcoma or carcinoma with metastases to or beyond the regional lymph nodes. Okay, if you don't have, if you've got skin cancer and you've got that, then you meet the listing. Alternatively, if you've got a carcinoma invading the deep extradermal structures, for example, it's going into the skeletal muscle, the cartilage, the bone, that also meets listing 1303. So you can see that what I've been saying about not just having that diagnosis, but here's specifically what they're looking at for that diagnosis, what they're going to want to see in the medical records. Here's 1305 lymphoma. If you've got a non-Hodgkin lymphoma, they're gonna look at either one or two of this A. They're either gonna want to see an aggressive lymphoma, persistent or recurrent following an initial anti-cancer therapy, or a lymphoma that requires initiation of more than one anti-cancer treatment regimen within a year, okay? So that's what they're looking at specifically for a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that's going to meet the listing. If it's a Hodgkin lymphoma, then it's got to have failed to achieve clinically complete remission or recurrent within 12 months of completing that initial anti-cancer therapy. If you've got lymphoma with a bone marrow or stem cell transplant, Social Security will find that you meet listing 1305 for 12 months from the date of the transplant. After that 12 month, 12 month in one day, Social Security is going to be looking at the residuals. Okay, what kind of residual impairment do you still have from the diagnosis, from the transplant, from what's been going on, or if you've got mantle cell lymphoma, that is a situation in which um, just kind of having that diagnosis looks like it would meet the listing. Okay. As you can see here, here are the specifics for a leukemia diagnosis, what social security is going to be looking at. And you can do this with any of the listings. I, I provided the list a few slides back. So that way you can take a look and see specifically which listing would apply in your situation. And this is exactly how the listings are worded. These are pulled, copied and pasted directly from the social security website. Um, I don't think I did any editorializing on them. So that way you can see that this is kind of social security language, what they are looking for specifically in the records. And what I will say is it can be helpful. Um, patient portals have really helped in a way because it allows us as the patients to be able to see 
what our doctor is writing in the notes. And so we can kind of have a little bit of insight into what social security is going to see. So that can be very helpful. If you have patient portal access, take a look at it, see what the doctor is writing, compare that to what social security is looking for. If your doctor is verbally telling you things that you see in the listing, but they are not written in the records, have that conversation with your doctor. Say, look doc, I've applied for social security disability because of this. Can you please notate, you know, two visits ago, you told me this verbally. Is that still true? Yes. Okay. Can you please make sure you put that in the notes from today's visit and say, you know, we again discussed or whatever they are comfortable with putting. Um, but if, it, if they're discussing it with you verbally, they should be able to go ahead and, and put that in the notes as well. Here's 1307, what Social Security is looking for specifically with multiple myeloma. And as you can see here, it, it notes that it's gotta be, the diagnosis has to be confirmed by appropriate serum or urine protein electrophoresis and bone marrow findings. So that lets you know that if you've got a multiple myeloma diagnosis, Social Security is gonna be looking for those specific records in the file. And if they're not there, they're gonna have a hard time finding that you meet the listing. Here is um, the listing for breast cancer, except sarcomas. As you can see, there's five different ways that you can meet the listing with breast cancer. None of them are easy, um, but it does give you quite a few options where if you've got that diagnosis, you can see five ways that Social Security will get those medical records as soon as they see that that's the situation they should be able to go ahead and approve it. But as you'll see, it's not as simple as just having that diagnosis. It's if you've got the breast cancer, it's gotta be locally advanced. Um, you know, it, it's gotta have kind of metastasized, unfortunately, to other parts. Um, same with B. Under C, it's gotta be a recurrent carcinoma, okay? Or D is a small cell carcinoma. Here's lung cancer. In these situations, a lot of it is just having the diagnosis. Um, as you'll see with A, it's got to be, um, it, it is just a diagnosis if you've got the non-small cell carcinoma and it's inoperable, unresectable, if it's recurrent or if it's metastatic, okay? So in those situations, you know, not that anybody wants that diagnosis necessarily, but that's a situation where just having the diagnosis can be enough to show social security, look, this is, this is where it is. Okay. Here we're going to look at pancreatic cancer. And again, this is a situation where if you've got the diagnosis, that should be good. So you want to make sure, um, I have had situations where I've had clients tell me that what their doctor's telling them, especially with respect to breast cancer, that they should meet the listing. And so I look at it and I look at, you know, I listen to the words that they're telling me and I say, you know, it does. But when I look at the file, the medical records, it's not in there. So that's where, you know, I've got some clients that are not super technology friendly. And so they don't want to deal with the patient portal. And I say to them, look, the, having that patient portal is such a blessing because you can go in there and you can see not only what the, the records are, but you can see the notes that your doctor is writing sometimes. So that way you can see, okay, doctor told me this, but then he or she wrote this down as a diagnosis. And if nothing else, to get that clarity for you, to, to so you know and understand, okay, this is what he's telling me. This is what the official diagnosis is, but they, they don't match up. So having that conversation, it could be very, very, very helpful. Here are the specifics for the prostate gland carcinomas. And then more considerations with respect to the social security cases. As I've been saying, medical records are key. They are so important. And it, it, the reason why is because if everybody applied for social security says, oh, I can't work. And here's why, you know, I've got somebody coming in to do my laundry for me. I've got somebody else coming in. Somebody has got to be home in order for me to shower somebody. I've got a shower chair, you know, that's fine. And, and that does come into play, but social security needs to see why, why is all of that happening? So they've got to have the medical records to back up your personal statements and your experiences. So medical records are critical. And remember, the issue in social security cases is not just can you go back to your past work, but are there any jobs that you can do in the national economy? 
I have a lot of um, very intelligent, very skilled clients that get frustrated when Social Security says, well, you could go be, you know, a, a stock clerk or a nut sorter or a security guard, um, you know, all kinds of crazy jobs that they're like, well, I, you know, I, I went to school for so long because this, this was my career. This was my passion. I don't want to go do something else. Well, that's not what Social Security is looking at. They're looking at, are there jobs that exist at all that you could go do? Okay. Lawyers and nurses. I love them both. My husband's in the medical field. I'm a lawyer. Um, we're a little stubborn about, you know, we we're proud of, of what we've been able to do as, as we should be. Um, but that's not what social security is looking at. They're not just looking at, can I go back to be a lawyer? Um, you know, they're looking at, is there another job that I could transition and do? And because I'm under 50, there's a lot of jobs that I could do. Um, you know, so it, it, that's important to remember is that as you get older, 50, 55, and again at 60, those rules do change a little bit. But by and large, that's what Social Security is looking at is not just can you go back to your past work, but are there other jobs you could do? OK, and as I just alluded to, if you are 50 and older, then the grid rules might apply, which help a little bit. Functional capacity can also be relevant. If you've got a doctor that's telling you, look, you can work three hours a day. That's not a, a dead social security case. That's your doctor saying, this is what you maximum, this is your maximum. You can work three hours a day. And by the way, those three hours are not three hours in a row. It's not nine to 12 every day. It's Monday, you might be able to do nine to 12 because you had a weekend of rest. Then Tuesday, you might be able to do one to four because you're not totally wiped. But by Wednesday, you're doing 10 to 11, two to three and six to seven. By Thursday, you are doing noon to one, four to five, and that's all you've got in you. And Friday, really all you can do is noon to one. Um, you know, so that's important. If you've got a doctor that's telling you that you've got certain limitations that push you down below working 20 hours a week, have them put that in the record. That's important. Specifically, why? Why are you limited to that? Is it, you know, maybe it's not a Monday through Friday specific, like I just mentioned, but you know, you've got to go to therapy on Mondays and Wednesdays. And so that means you are sitting there for three hours on Monday. You're sitting there for three hours on Wednesday. Tuesday, you're in bed all day because you're exhausted. Thursday and Friday, you're in bed all day because you're exhausted after Monday and Wednesday. So that can be super important to have that put in the record from a doctor as well. And at the same time, subjective, that, that would be subjective from the doctor, objective medical records are important. As I mentioned at the beginning, surgical reports, pathological or pathology reports um, can be very important in cancer cases. All right, nearing the end, how can an attorney help you? So this is not everything that we do, but it's, it's a small sampling of some of the things that we do. We provide guidance on what correspondence from Social Security actually means. I get calls from clients, potential clients all the time. I got this letter from Social Security. I don't know what it means. Um, you know, and all I have to have them do is read off the, the title of the form or the letter read the first paragraph of a letter. And I'm like, all right, this, this is what you need to do. Um, we help you file necessary appeals. We review your case file. We review the medical records. We had those conversations with you. If you're telling us the doctor's saying one thing, I'm looking at the records, I'm not seeing it. So I'm going to let you know, hey, next time you go, talk to your doctor. We discuss what additional records could be helpful in your case. As you saw, Social Security does have certain things that they look for in the file. They do that with every single case. So there are certain things that can be helpful sometimes. We also can review your documents for accuracy and completeness. We cannot fill out the forms for you. No one knows what you go through on a daily basis better than you. And that's why we will ask you every time a form comes, sometimes they will send you one at the initial and then they'll send you the same one at the recon. And I say, look, things have changed, haven't they? they it's been five months since they last sent you that form. Have things gotten better, worse, or stayed the same? And probably eight out of 10 times, it's things have gotten a little bit worse. Not drastically, hopefully, most of the time. That may happen one or two out of 10 times. But most of the time, it's, yeah, you know, five months ago, I, I could get up and I could wash the dishes all in one fell swoop. But now I'm, I'm having to sit back down. My, my lumbar spine pain is getting too to a, a point. Um, so that's what we do. In that same line, we can discuss what Social Security is looking for in their forms that they're sending. We work with you and the agency back and forth to provide relevant updates to both. 
We send you monthly updates with what's going on and we send them any updates that happen. We also prepare you for a hearing before an administrative law judge and question you and any witnesses during that hearing. Oftentimes the witnesses are the agency's witnesses um, and they're not the agency's witnesses in the sense that they work for the agency, they're going to be on their side. They're the agency's witnesses, and that's who's paying them to be there. That the agency, Social Security, asks for a vocational witness to be there. They ask for a medical witness to be there. And those individuals respond to questions posed by the judge, or if you've got an attorney, by your attorney. So that's how an attorney can help you. Here is my contact information. I will also put a link in, if you're watching the replay, um, I will put a link in to schedule a call. And if you're on the live, we'll go ahead and put that in the chat now as well. But what I will say is you can either schedule a call directly, you can give us a call, send us an email, let us know how we can help. Um, I like to come from a place of education. This is the first time you've gone through this, I would imagine. Um, you know. Even if you've gone through it once before with respect to applying for disability, it may have been different. You still may not know totally what's going on. This is what I do. Um, so let me help you. I'm always happy to help in any way that I can. If you have questions, if I can be of help, please feel free to reach out. Um, I did not mention at the beginning of this webinar, I usually do, I apologize. I do not take any questions. Um, on the webinar because I don't want you putting any of your personal health information out there. Please also, I do not answer questions on, in the comments on the replay. Um, if, you know, if you've got a story or something like that or a comment that doesn't share your personal health information, feel free to put it down there. But anytime I see comments that come through that have some personal identifying information or health information, I don't like that to be out there. Um, I, I don't want people to know that much about you. So if we can be of help, reach out. Have a fabulous day. Thanks.